so much easier to raise your hand and be like, I don't know this and I'm not good at it. And yeah. who's better at it than me? Because A, it's exhausting to pretend, but I totally. think you're just much stronger when you surround yourself with strength. You gotta pick yourself up, go backwards and slam yourself at the wall like 500 more times until the wall crumbles. 25% of middle school girls already believe they'll never achieve their dream career. Dream career. Hi, I'm Kara Golden, founder and CEO of Hint. Hint. And you're Hint. listening to Unstoppable, a podcast spotlighting the journeys of inspiring entrepreneurs. I believe that at its core, leadership is about constantly learning from the people around you. And I'm so inspired by the conversations we're having in our upcoming episodes and can't wait to share them with you. This season, some of my guests include Andrew Dudham, founder of Hims, Erica Nardini, CEO of Barstool Sports, Daniel Dubois and Whitney Tingle, co-founders of Sakara Life, and much, much more. Plus, we ask the million dollar question, what does it really take to be unstoppable? Unstoppable. Let's find out. Hi, everybody. It's Kara Golden with Unstoppable, and I'm so, so excited to have Rebecca Minkoff here. Yay. Say hi, Rebecca. Hello. So we're just coming off of Fashion Week, and actually we worked with Rebecca on Fashion Week, and she gave us a very, very cool spot inside of her beautiful, beautiful fashions. So we not only kept people hydrated, but also our logo was kind of very artistically integrated into the whole thing. So thank you for that. It was really, it was super, super fun. So very excited. So just a little bit of background on Rebecca in case you guys don't know who she is. You've been hiding under a rock somewhere. So Rebecca Minkoff is, uh, is, uh, a designer, um, a friend as well, and it's just a cool individual overall. And so Rebecca moved to New York City uh, when she was only 18 years old. Wow, that's a story in and of itself. Um, probably most people know Rebecca for her version of the I Love New York t-shirts that were 2001. Is that right around that yeah. time? That's awesome. And then that continued continued on into a collection of a uh, handbag and lots of other great stuff. I'll let you kind of tell more of that story. But over the years, we were just talking about this is her 20th fashion week. Is I that- think so. I'd have to really make sure I'm counting right, but twice a year for 10 years is, yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. So, um, so very, very cool. And how many stores now? Two. Two stores? Yeah. And just your design? In the U.S., everywhere. two stores. Two we have stores Outside of the U.S., we have about six more. Very, very cool. So welcome. Thanks. Welcome. I'm glad to be here. Yeah, thanks. So tell us a little bit about, so, you know, you got here when you were 18. I mean, what was sort of the thinking? Did you know you were going to get into fashion when you moved here? And where'd you come from? So by way of San Diego, we moved to Florida when I was eight and it was devastating to me. Um, So we lived in Florida and at 18, I was like, I've got to get the hell out of Dodge. There's nothing for me here. And I had had this fascination with moving to New York, becoming a designer. I had fallen in love with sewing as early as eight, sewing my own clothing, um, making my bat mitzvah dress, my prom dress, all the costume department dresses in my performing arts high school. So it was definitely an area that I was well versed in mm-hmm. and had a passion for. And I was able to secure an internship with a designer and it was minimum wage was the pay. And so uh, with nowhere to live and two suitcases, I said to my parents, I'm moving. And I think I finally distilled down the emotion because people are like, weren't you scared? And I kind of uh, equated to that feeling when you know you're dating the wrong guy and everyone's telling you don't date him, but nothing's going to stop you from yeah. being with him. That was my feeling for like, I have to get to New York. That's awesome. So nothing was going to stop me. So I came here and lived on my friend's couch. Who was the first? What was that first job? Uh, his name is Craig Taylor. He does not have a company anymore. But at the time, he had a really great business making very luxurious men's shirts for women. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Very, very interesting. Yeah. And so what, so you get this job, you're like, where, where were you living? I was time? living in Florida. Okay. I got the internship, uh, over the summer, had my last summer of, I guess, innocence. And then in late September of two, uh, 1999, I moved up here. And what was your best story first couple of weeks of living in New York? Well, I froze my ass off <laughs> because we went winter shopping for me in Florida 
and nothing is the weight that it needs to be. Totally. And so I was like dying when I got here. I hadn't experienced cold like that before. And my mom was like, okay, I'll take you to Century 21, but no coats over $100. I don't know if you know this, but like coats under $100 don't also keep you that warm. Yeah. I mean, at the time, now you have many more options, but That's the unique clothes so- in the Zara's didn't exist then. So That's- where were you living? So I, I stayed for the first two weeks with my friend at Fordham University. He would sme- sneak me into his dorm room every night. And then I was like, all right, I've so made it funny. two weeks. My parents are definitely going to get me an apartment. And they were like, no, we've negotiated with your cousin. Uh, you can live in her daughter's playroom if you babysit twice a week. That, is that was my first nine months here. That's crazy. Yeah. And then – and so – The uh, design of the I Love New York t-shirts. How did that come about? That came about because I had been in the Caribbean um, as part of this artist summit. And I loved how the t-shirts were cut up and trends were different then. But I loved the beads and that it was all kind of DIY. And I came home and I was like, I don't want a tourist. I don't want to say Aruba. I want to say New York. So I made one. I wore it. My sister-in-law saw it and wanted it. She was at dinner with uh, a family friend, Jenna Elfman, who is an actress, and Jenna wanted it. So I, I like was th- so thrilled. The celebrity won in my shirt, and I made it to her, sent it to her on September 9th. Never forget that day, 2001. And she wore it on Jay Leno on September 13th. And he asked her about the shirt, and she had worn it in response to obviously what had just happened. And you could have never predicted that, that happening. And uh, the inbound. Then again, going back in time, you remember like press was very meaningful then. If something was in a magazine, people had to have it. So I was flooded with orders and decided to give the proceeds to the Red Cross. And then I was flooded with more orders. And that's all I did for nine months. That was crazy. So how did you keep up with that? I mean, you had to fund it. You had to, right? I I had to fund it and I didn't have much money at all. And that was three years into my job with the designer. And they had also decided to let me go at that time. And it was a it was a kind firing. The CEO was like, you know what you're doing? Go do it. And I was like, do I know what I'm doing now? <laughs> I don't know that I do, but okay. Um, I was fortunate enough to meet a woman who had a website that did e-commerce and that was the early days of e-commerce and she loved the shirts. And so she ordered a bunch and I said, I don't even have enough money to like go buy the goods down right here on the corner of Mercer and Canal. That was my place. Um, it's so crazy can you prepay me? And she's like, sure, I'll prepay you. So she would prepay me for uh, an order of shirts. I had then had the money to go purchase them. And then she would pay me the balance. That's, that's crazy. Yeah. And then beyond the shirt, you branched out into a bag. How did that come about? So the shirt and the clothing line that I had had that no one really cared about was lasted for about four years of just doing apparel. Mm-hmm. And it was fine. It was a okay business. Um, but there was, it just felt like it was just me always pushing and mm-hmm. I lacked the momentum of like, there's something here that people want in a way that I can make a living. Um, and so the bag came about four years later in 2005 when again, Jenna, I was at dinner with her and she said, do you make bags? And I lied to her and I said, yep, I do. And she said, I need one in two weeks. It's for a film. The bag's an important part of the character. I said, great. I love this. So I went back to my vendors that I already knew from, you know, buying fabric and leather. And I said, where do I make a bag in New York City? And they gave me a bunch of addresses. I hit, hit them all up, found a vendor, sketched my design and said, can you make this? And I need it in two weeks. So two samples were made, one for me, one for her. I kept one, you know, to get into magazines and stuff once the film came out. And then FedEx didn't deliver it on time and they started filming without it. And it didn't Crazy. get it. And I was devastated. I was like, this is the last $800 I had. And I didn't even really have $800. I put the money on like a credit card advance. Just let you know, my credit card limit was $500 at the time. So they like, let me get it to 800. And I just said, well, I just bought myself my first designer bag and I'll just carry it around the city. And I got stopped enough times that I was like, wow, people are loving my bag. And that's when I thought there might be something here. So I showed it to a friend it's kind of a long story. I showed it to a friend who was a buyer for a store in LA called Satine. And she said, I'm going to buy it for the store. And then I'm going to get Daily Candy to write about it. I remember Daily Candy. God yeah. bless Daily Candy. So yeah. at the time, again, in the in the dark ages, um, Daily Candy was one email totally. a day that had the power to transform brands in, in a way that I don't know exists today. And so the writer wrote about it. It sold out. And that was the beginning of what's now the brand. That's amazing. Yeah. And so you really used press 
right? Not use them. That's the wrong term. But I mean, you really like in addition, I always tell people like, it's not just about having a great product. You also have to get the word out. Right. And I think you've done a terrific job. I mean, just talking about the daily candy and, yeah. you know, like, I think that that's really critical that just, you know, in any business, in any category, I think that it's really, really important. And just because you, you know, have a great product today, I always talk about it. You know, I'm in the food industry, right? And I always give people tickets to Expo West, just the big food show and Anaheim. And people come in who haven't been to a food show and they're like, oh my God, there's like all these food things here. And what's crazy is only 10% of them actually ever make it to the shelf. Wow. Like it's crazy. It's that. And I'm sure in the fashion industry, it's the same thing. It's so competitive. But I think it's how do you get the word out? Like how do you connect with people? Like, you know, some people use influencers, some people don't use influencers. But I think it's so critical. And you've just been, and like really great at cultivating those relationships too, which is kudos to you. Thanks. Yeah. I think it's about obviously we're in a new day and age and stuff is shifting even faster than ever, but it's sort of like what is there's always a version of that. If it's on a magazine yeah. today, if it's on an influencer, is it I'm scared to say TikTok. But you know, what are those the outlets? Right podcast, the right, right podcast. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> but what are those outlets where your customer is and and then how do you create it? And some people are not good at it, but you know, I'm not good at sales. I can't read an Excel spreadsheet with numbers very well, but like I can do press and design. Yeah. No, I think it's, it's super great. So, uh, you brought your brother in or your brother joined you, however you want to say that. Like, how did that all come about? That all came about because when I got, so Satine sold out of the order and I didn't have any money to produce the next run because they had ordered 12 and they came back with an order for 75 after it sold out and I didn't have any money at all. So I called my dad and I was like, okay, I promise this won't be a waste of money for you. Will you please loan me whatever, two, 3000 bucks? He was like, no, we're, we're good here. Uh, but call your brother. He might loan you the money. So my brother had a software company. He had a totally his own independent life. Is he older? He's older. older. Okay. Yeah. Five years. And, um, he asked me a ton of questions. He's like, I'll loan you the initial advance. And then when those bags sold out and more stores started calling and he could see as a businessman, like, the heat behind the brand and the heat that was coming. So, you know, instead of just loaning money, he started advising on business stuff. And it was like business one-on-one. Like, do you have a tax ID? Do you have two separate bank accounts? You know, okay, good. Now we have to get like just basic stuff set up. And then he was like, I'll fly in once a month. And then it became once a week. And I'll just never forget we had this threshold. And I was like, when we hit X in sales, you have to move here because I can't do this. And I know where I'm good and I know where I'm bad. And like, stuff starting to crumble in the areas I'm not good at. So we hit that milestone uh, eight years ago and he moved his whole family up. Oh, wow. Yeah. Because he had been commuting from Florida and he's like, I don't know my three-year-old. I'd like to know my kid. So That's awesome. Yeah. So do you think you talk about, I mean, I think this this is an entrepreneurial, like very, very key thing that you said. You probably don't even realize that you said, but the fact that you actually knew that you weren't good at certain things. Right. And like, I think like that is, that is such a key thing it's, and, you know, really knowing what you're good at and what you're not good at and like bringing those resources in. And I think the more trusted they are with that relationship with your brother, yeah, like all the better. But what, what do you think you like, do you see that as well? And people like they, you know, put this bravado on like, oh, I'm great at everything. And like, they won't own the things that they're not really that great at. And yeah. I don't know why, because it's so much easier to raise your hand and be like, I don't know this and I'm not good at it. And yeah. who's better at it than me? Because, hey, it's exhausting to pretend, but I totally. think you're just much stronger when you surround yourself with strength. And yeah. so I think my, always my, even in hiring, it's like, what, what do I not do well? And then that's, you know, one of my first hires was a girl who had sewn and sketched her whole life and she could do that and wanted to do that full time. So the minute she started, I put my pencil down. I was like, all right, you're going to sketch my ideas now. And would I like to be the designer in the back, like sketching each one like Carl Lagerfeld? Sure. Totally. But like I'm much better doing some other things, offloading my ideas. So yeah. I don't know. I was always just like, who cares if you're not good at something? We can't all be perfect. No, that's awesome. And now you're just, I mean, you're running this huge global brand. And the other thing that you did that I saw at Fashion Week is that you've launched a kids collection. Which yeah. 
like I wish would have been around when my kids were, Let you know, that age. Cause I always said like they're, you know, the clothes were so lacking. So, and you've got three kids of your, of your own. So three. do you think that really inspired you to, you know, obviously. To, yeah. Um, so talk a little bit about that. So we had been talking about kids for a long time. And I think right now, anything we launch, we want to be strategic. And we were lucky enough to meet a partner. Their company is called Resonance. And they are a technology company that makes apparel. Mm -hmm. And so we were able to tap into their technology, which when you buy a dress off the rack, there's probably inventory. There's all the unused sample yardage Mm -hmm. that then you see at Mood Fabrics and Project Runway, you know, some of these designers buy. So how they've shifted this is everything is in white and it's all cotton, silk, wool. And the minute they get an order, they print whatever the pattern is on the fabric um, with earth-friendly chemicals. And then they cut it. And so not only does it reduce waste and inventory and fabric overages, but it also they optimize the pattern, which you can't do on pre-printed fabric. So there's very little fabric waste at the end. So all the little cutouts and scraps um, are biodegradable and there's less of them. And then you get your order. And so it was a way to launch kids without increasing a wasteful footprint. And I thought if you are going to launch kids and there's all this talk about the planet that they're inheriting, why not make sure that it's a healthy launch and something that is fun and playful and speaks to the brand, but also like I don't have to lose sleep over like Um, at just adding more crap to the planet. Yeah, no, definitely. So, and how, how did the show go for you? I mean, it was great. I mean, I, I know now what I'm going to experience and I just have to be like, this is going to be like a really intense two hours. Yeah. And it's, it's like a wedding, right? It's like a wedding. You're like, I hope everyone else had a good time because I worked my ass off and I was only half yeah. present. Yeah. And you're the, you're the uh, one that everybody wants to talk you're to. the monkey in the cage. And, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and it's probably a little bit overwhelming. So. I had about 30 seconds right before we started where I like just looked at everything and I was like, take it in because this is all you're getting. But it was... It was great. That's that's awesome. Well, it was absolutely beautiful and so exciting. Oh, so I think I told you I brought my um, my aunt and her sister and their their you know New Yorkers you know through and through and born and raised here. And I I was uh, talking to one of them and I said, Oh, what are you doing this weekend? And I told her that I was going to your show and she said, You know, I've never been to Fashion Week. And I said, Well, you were coming with yeah. me and so this was her, her first one and she's in her 70s and oh, she was awesome. like oh my god it was so much fun oh, now good. I can tell all my friends that I've gone to fashion week yeah again. check it off her bucket list yeah exactly it was super super fun so female founder collective yes talk to me a little bit about that so I launched that in the end of 2018 out of a frustration of the wage conversation that we all have to keep having women making 80 cents on the dollar, women of color, 50 to 60 cents on the dollar. Um, and also trying to figure out a way, like as a mother, I turn over all my products to see what's inside of them. And that determines my purchasing decision. And so could we create a way for the consumer to also just know who's a female founded company and who's not? I love it. And networking for me, the right network for me has always been very powerful and I'm sure you feel this way, but as a founder, you, when you're having a bad day or you need something, you can't go like vomit on your staff. But if you could talk to another founder and get a resource or commiserate with them, totally, that would be helpful. Yeah. So the idea was threefold. It was creating the network for the founders to connect, creating the seal, and then also creating a database a directory of all these women. So the directory hasn't launched yet, and that's all my fault. Um, but the, the other two are, have launched. So this, we have over 7,000 members and the seals on over 3 million products today and we're just getting started. And then it's education. Cause again, as me as a founder, I never learned how to read a profit and loss statement or knew what the word EBITDA is. Look it up. Um, I Googled it under a table in an investor meeting cause they kept saying it. And I was like, what does this even mean? But as a, so if you could have that information and given to you, and not going back to business school, I think it's really helpful. So we have events twice a year that do the education piece of this. Um, and then hopefully we'll do more in the future online. That's awesome. In your spare time, you just in all my like spare time. this. Well, I'm going to say this because you're like, how do you do it? And I never want to create an unrealistic expectation of what women can do. Mm-hmm. So I think hires are very critical and I do not do this alone. I have an amazing team. 
But right after the birth of my third child, I hired a critical person that took over the management, day-to-day management of my design team. So while I still design and have ideas, the day-to-day nitty-gritty of is the content of your sweater 80% wool or 20 or is it the exact Pantone? I don't have to make those micro decisions anymore. So when I did that, I had like 50% more time. Mm-hmm. And so I could be the face. I could launch a podcast. I could start the Female Founder Collective. And then now I have a co-founder in the Female Founder Collective, Allison Wyatt. So I think it's about finding those right people and then that's awesome. getting them to help you lay the bricks. I want to join. the Yes. Yes, we definitely should. So Female Founded Company. No, I'd heard about it about a year ago. Yeah. And uh, it's, very, it's really, really cool that you did that. So Thanks. it's awesome. Yeah. like what you heard, please help spread the word and leave us a review. You can also follow along with me on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn at Kara Golden. Do you have a question for me or want to nominate an innovator to spotlight? Please talk to me at Kara Golden on Twitter. Thanks so much for listening. Until next time, be unstoppable. Unstoppable. unstoppable.